Well, it is great, great to be here with you this morning um, during our equipping hour. This uh, equipping hour, Sunday school hour, uh, we cover some different topics. Uh, a lot of times theology, we've been looking at some practical Christian living. Uh, Smed's done a couple series on just critical thinking in the world that we're in. Well, this week we're, gonna, we're actually going to look at church history. So we like to do that from time to time just to give you a, a bigger picture of of kind of the shoulders that we, that we stand on. Um, it's great for us just to, to learn from church history. You've obviously heard the phrase, those who fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And I think this goes for, uh, for the church as well. We have a lot of uh, lessons to learn from the, the past, from church history. So uh, I'm going to pray for our time, and then we're going to dive in and uh, look at uh, what I'm calling revivalism. So would you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to gather. Thank you that we get to be part of your family. Thank you that you have called us out of the world, out of darkness, uh, into the kingdom of your Son. I just pray that this morning would be uh, a time of just sweet fellowship with one another. It would be a time of growth in your truth, Lord, that your saints would be edified. I pray that even this morning, uh, as your word goes forth, Lord, that you would save sinners, that you would draw people to yourself. I pray that Jesus would be magnified in this place. pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking at uh, the the basis for this, uh, I guess you could call it a a lecture, is uh, this book called Revival and Revivalism by Ian Murray. Revival and Revivalism, uh, just a really helpful resource that that paints a picture of, uh, of the American revivals in the 17 and 1800s but what it does for you, more than that, is it actually helps us to, to be situated with where we're at. How did, how did the church in America get to be where it is today? What are the, the kind of things that you see as you look around? Maybe a, a consumeristic church mindset, a pragmatic church culture, a results-driven church. How do we get more people in the doors? You actually read about church history, you read about American church history, and you find out pretty quick, oh, this is how we got here. This is the, the kind of things that took place even in the 1700s and 1800s, that led us to, to be where we're at today as a culture. So it's going to be really helpful for us. Um, and my goal today is actually to, to recover the word revival. I want to re- recover for you the word revival. I was talking to, uh, to someone about this, this topic, and they said, ooh, revival. Ooh, I don't like that word. And, uh, and I pressed them a little bit. And the reason is, is because as they think about uh, revival, they, they hear this kind of mystical Christianity, some kind of experientialism, uh, forced to some kind of decisional, uh, you got to just make a, make a decision for Christ, altar calls, all those things, you know, big tent revival, singing the same lyric, song after song after song. So that, you know, that kind of revival, we could say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to recover that, but a, a biblical kind of revival, a revival where the, the Spirit uh, is poured out in, in large measure, where people are saved. Where, where whole societies are transformed by the gospel. That's the kind of revival that we want to recover, that we want to pray for, that actually we want to we be about as a church. So I'm just going to read you a quote as we start. Of, uh, this is uh, Samuel Davies. He was a, a preacher in the, the first Great Awakening, and this is how he describes uh, revival. He says, About 16 years ago, in the northern colonies, when all religious concern was much out of fashion, And the generality lay in a a dead sleep in sin, having at best but the form of godliness, but nothing of the power. When the country was in peace and prosperity, free from the calamities of war and epidemic of all sicknesses, when, in short, there were no extraordinary calls to repentance, suddenly a deep general concern about eternal things spread through the country. Sinners started out of their slumbers, broke off from their vices, and began to cry out, What shall we do to be saved? And they made it the great business of their life to prepare for the world to come. The gospel seemed almighty and carried all before it. It pierced the very hearts of men with an irresistible power. I have seen thousands at once melted down under it, all eager to hear as for life and hardly a dry eye to be seen among them. He goes on to say that many have since backslidden and their religion has come to nothing and dwindled away into mere formality, but blessed be God, thousands still remain, 
shining monuments of the power of divine grace in that glorious day. So that, that's the kind of revival that we're talking about, that we want to pray for, uh, where he says that men made it the great business of their life to prepare for the world to come, uh, where the gospel seemed almighty. Uh, that kind of revival we can pray for, we can get on board with, I'm sure. Uh, the gospel going forth in this city. And I'm sure you, you probably saw in the news recently uh, a revival. It was called a revival, the, the Ashbury Revival, a small uh, Wesleyan school in Kentucky. And what started out as just a normal chapel service, I think there was a, a sermon that was preached, a couple songs, and then what happened after the service was people stayed. And they stayed for, for 20 minutes and they sang more songs. And the 20 minutes became an hour, became two hours. And eventually, 10 days, this drew out with impromptu sermons, with singing, with people coming up front, confessing sins. And you hear that, and, you know, there's nothing maybe, maybe life-changing. There's no society that's transformed by that. It sounds, okay, we could, we could wait and see what the effect is, but, but really, the, maybe the, the negative part of that, we see with what happened next, which is when there was people that flew in to see it, other people that came, all of a sudden crowds. How do, how do we get a hold of this revival? How do we take it to other places? What's the, the secret sauce that you're doing here that we can export into our college campuses? And all of a sudden you have this, what we would call revivalism, this revivalistic mindset that said, how do we create this experience that you have? How do we manufacture it and ship it out? So that, that's not the, the revival that we're talking about, not something that you can market. But, uh, but actual revival. So the encouragement today is, and the hope is that you would actually pray for revival, for, for the Spirit to be poured out, for this city to be transformed. I mean, we live in a country that desperately needs revival. Uh, we need God's Spirit to be outpoured so that the hearts and minds would be transformed by the gospel. You just think about the world around us that's more confused than ever, uh, more sinful, more immoral, there's more lies and deception. I mean, what a time as today for the gospel to, to break forth, for God's word to go out. And we have to define our terms as we start. So define the term revival. I mean, the basic meaning of revival is to, to make alive again, to, you know, to revive something that, that's dead, to, to bring to life. Obviously, every conversion is a bringing to life. Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in sins but God made you alive. So that is the, the conversion story. Every Christian story is a, a revival in that sense, an awakening, being brought from death to life. So we talk about revival. What we mean really is just a, a large-scale conversion. Many people in, in the same place, in the same time, being converted. God doing what he normally does through the preaching of the word, but doing it in large measure. Uh, Ian Murray, in this book, he talks about special seasons where God does a remarkable manner and he revives religion among his people, where the Spirit is outpoured and it produces a public reformation so that you have this awakening to truth broadly. That, that would be the definition of revival. And he goes on to, to explain that, that revival, the whole theory of revival is involved in these two facts. It says, first, that the influence of the Holy Spirit is concerned in every instance of sound conversion so it's the Spirit who converts. And two, this influence of the Spirit is granted in more copious measure and greater power at some times more than others. When these facts concur, there is a revival of religion. So it's just the Spirit converting people and doing it in great measure. Uh, visibly seeing people saved. He goes on to say, What happens in revivals is not to be seen as something miraculously different from the regular experience of the church. The difference lies in degree, not in kind. This is just the Holy Spirit doing what he does, illuminating blind eyes to the gospel, a truth coming to the heart through the Spirit's work, regeneration and faith. And it's not done through some formula, through some secret sauce, through some special meeting, through a certain kind of music, but it's done through the word being proclaimed and through earnest prayer of God's people. And this is something that, that our nation desperately needs. This is something that our city desperately needs, our culture desperately needs. So as we uh, hopefully recover this idea of revival this morning, 
I want to look at just three, three instances of revival, just to help, help inform our thoughts on what are we talking about? What is revival? So the first one, just to put up the outline for you, we're going to have, uh, number one, uh, look at the Bible. It's a great place to start, a good place to end. Uh, and then the, we're also going to look at uh, American revivals, the, the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening would be a, an example of a, a genuine revival. At least that's what Ian Murray argues for, a genuine revival where God's Spirit is outpoured in large measure. And then you have the Second Great, great Awakening uh, in the 1800s, and that would be more of a revivalism, trying to create revival. How do we, how do we make this happen on our own? And then lastly, we'll just look at why does it matter? What are some implications for us? What are some applications for us to think about? Uh, one pastor in the 1750s, he, uh, he prayed for revival this way. He prayed that religion may revive where it is professed and spread where it is not known. Revive where it is professed and spread where it is not known. And that, that sounds pretty biblical, so if you're wondering, is, is revival biblical? Well, in that sense, yes, it is. To want Christ to be known where he's not named, Paul says this in Romans, and to want those that, that at least claim Christ to, to walk in obedient faith. You think about just uh, two, different, two different aspects of evangelism there. You have uh, Peter going to the, the Jews, going to the, the house of Israel, those that have the law, those that have the prophets, and preaching to them of their Messiah. And then you have Paul going to, to the pagans. And in both cases, we're going to see two different examples of a, of a revival, mass conversion, large-scale conversion. So we'll look at just uh, three examples, one from Paul, one from Peter. But before that, I want to look at uh, an Old Testament example. So if you would turn, turn your Bible to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. And as we look at some of these examples, just want to, to go through quickly and just just put in your mind, just what are some observations we can make? What are some hallmarks that are, that are true in all of these situations? What are the, the, key, uh, the key events, the key, the key happenings? What are the responses here of the people? And hopefully this will uh, whet your appetite. Uh, ben James is going to be teaching through the book of Nehemiah tonight. So hopefully, Ben, I don't, don't steal your thunder, but just want to read through just some, just some things in Nehemiah 8 to see a, a revival in the Old Testament. You have uh, here, the, the Jews have just finished rebuilding the wall, the exiles that have returned from Babylon. They've already rebuilt the temple, and now they've finished the wall around Jerusalem. And you get to Nehemiah 8, and you have this uh, revival event documented. Look at Nehemiah 8, verse 1. It says, And all the people gathered as one man at the square which is in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women and those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And you go on to read, uh, verse 6, Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up hands when they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In verse 7, it goes on to say that, that the Levites explained the law to the people while they remained in their place. And they read from the book of the law, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. You had a group of, of Jews here that, that didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't understand so they had to explain to them in their native tongue now, in, in Aramaic. So they're explaining, they're translating, they're preaching to them. They're saying, this is what this, this says, this is what it means, this is what it requires of you. And then you see the, the response, the response of the people. They hear God's word proclaimed. And they respond in, in, in humble faith. They first are, are convicted. Look at verse 9. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this, is the day, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. So God's word is opened, it's expounded, it's preached. 
and they actually come under conviction. They're weeping. They understand what it says. They understand its requirements on them. They understand that they have not obeyed this law, and they weep. There is a brokenness over sin. And you can see here in this passage, just to, just to highlight for you, what, what is causing this? What's the highlight here? Uh, verse 1, he brought the book of the law. Verse 2, he read from the book of the law. Verse 5, he opened the book. Verse 7, he explained the book of the law. Verse 8, they read from the book of the law. They translated to give the sense of it. Then verse 13, on the second day, the heads of the father's households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. So they come back the next day wanting to hear more from God's word. There's an eagerness for God's word. Look at verse 18. He read from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. On the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. So this isn't the the Ashbury revival with a bunch of students singing songs and just hanging out, staying up late. This is all the clans of Israel coming together, the leaders of the clans, taking ownership, saying, teach us the law, reading daily for seven days, hearing God's word. And then you see the response in chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. On the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So it leads to them confessing sin. There's not just a brokenness, confession, uh, repentance. We want to turn away from these sins. That is the the response. That's That's a true revival. God's word being opened people responding in in faith, being broken over their sin. And look at what it leads to in chapter 9. Look at verse 5. They they rise up, the Levites rise up, and they bless God. They say, Oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens. I mean, this ends with worship of God. That's what it's going for. Not just a, hey, here, here's a message so that you can have an escape from hell, so you can have a better life, but actually a message that leads them to worship, to praise God. That is the, the, the message that we proclaim, is a, is a message to become worshipers of the king. So this is a, a genuine revival. God's word being open, his law revealing his character, his just demands in front of them, it proclaimed with authority. There's conviction over sin. There's obedient living. Uh, soberness here. Not just the emotionalism, but there is emotion. Deep emotion, all right? There's weeping. They have to be told to stop weeping because they're so emotional. And it's pretty simple, the, the, the process here. The word is proclaimed and, and people are changed. And I want to turn now to the, maybe the most famous revival in your Bible, Maybe the second most famous. I think the most famous might be uh, Ezekiel, the dry bones that are that are revived. The Spirit actually breathes life into this valley of bones. But maybe the second most famous, Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Peter's sermon at Pentecost, and I'm sure you know it well. There's three thousand. It ends with just to to steal the punchline. It ends with three thousand people being added in a day. Three thousand genuine converts. And we talked about revivals being an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, clearly here at Pentecost, the the Spirit is at work. Chapter 2, it starts with the the Holy Spirit coming as fire upon the the believers here that are gathered. He's clearly present in the preaching of the word here. But look at at Peter's message, Acts 2.22. Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death 
since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I mean, just listen to this hard-hitting message. You crucified the Son of God. You are culpable. You are guilty. You are liable. And in this, there's also a message of hope that, that he has put to death the hostility, that he is raised from the dead, both a, a hope in the gospel and a, a condemnation. You are guilty before this God. And he goes on in, in verse 32 to, to preach the resurrection, that Jesus is exalted at the right hand. And he's preaching scripture throughout. You see the all caps in your Bible, if you have all caps for Old Testament references. Peter is preaching scripture. He is preaching the Old Testament. This is proclamation of God's word. And then look at the response. Verse 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you see the response. There's conviction over sin. There's a response, a repentant response. What can we do to be saved? You know, we are guilty before this holy God. And look at verse 40. It says that Peter, with many other words, solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. He goes on to exhort. He's not done. He doesn't just say, hey, here's a message, take it or leave it. No, he's exhorting. He's pleading with them. He's actually speaking to their will. You must embrace this message. You must bow your will. You must bow yourself before this message. And then you have in verse 41, the, the revival here. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls in a day. Proclamation of the word, the Holy Spirit at work in hearts, a conviction over sin, repentance, a new life here granted by the Holy Spirit. And then you see the, what happens, the, the change of life that follows. Verse 41 and following. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, sorry, I apologize, 40, 42, says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. It goes on to say that they, they had all things together. They're selling their property and sharing with one another. So they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, they're devoted to one another, gathering in this, this first church. There's a, a radical transformation of life that, that happened. That, that, that actually, the, the, the transformation that happened at the, the repentance, the faith, is seen in the way that they live now. So just consider just some of the, you talk about revival, just big picture, some of the, the hallmarks here in this passage. You have God's spirit at work. You have the, the preacher bringing the word, exhorting the will of the listener, pleading with them to repent. You have a, a clear proclamation of truth. Peter preaches authoritatively. He preaches confidently. And there is conviction over sin. They are crying out to be saved. And then you have a change of life. I want to look at just more, one more example, hopefully uh, just to convince you, <laughs> again, to convince you that, that revival is biblical, that we should pray for revival, that we should want revival, that we should want to see these things happen in our city, that we should want to, to see the gospel proclaimed so that many would be saved. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And this one's a little bit different. Because uh, Nehemiah and Acts 2 are, are the people of Israel of the audience. You get to Acts 19, and now it's a, a pagan culture uh, in Ephesus. Paul starts with the Jews, but then ends up just in, in Gentile territory. So look at uh, Acts 19. We'll start in verse 8. So Paul has come to Ephesus. There's a, a group of, of followers of John the Baptist ministry. Paul tells them about, about Jesus. They are followers now of Jesus. And then now it says that, verse 8, And Paul entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, 
he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So you have here Paul, uh, what is he speaking? Well, it says in uh, verse 10 that all heard the word of the Lord. He is proclaiming God's word. He is proclaiming God's message. He is preaching God's truth. And he's preaching it boldly. He's pre- preaching it clearly. He's saying that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Everyone in this whole territory heard because of Paul's proclamation. And then you go, go down to, to verse 18. It says, Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and de- disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And as you keep reading, you see that there's actually an uproar in the city because the, uh, the silversmith industry has been disrupted. There's an ec- economic meltdown because of the, the gospel taking root in the city. Uh, so, much, so much so that, that the, the vendors now are saying, we have no more customers. I just think about as you, you drive to this church down Elliott, just a, a mile or two down, just like an adult store every time I drive by, and just think about what would it look like for, for the gospel to have such a, a broad reach in this city, that that store goes out of business, that they knock on our door and say, would you guys stop preaching that message because we have no more customers? I mean, that's the kind of uh, repentance that you see here in Ephesus. The, the gospel going, going forth and repentance so much so that, that whole industries are disrupted because of the repentance, because they're burning all their magic books. They're turning from idols. So that is a, a genuine revival, a repentance and faith proclamation of God's word. In verse 20, I think could be, a, I would say, is the, the mantra verse for revival. What is revival? Well, Acts 19.20, so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. If you want a, a biblical definition of revival, God's word growing mightily, prevailing in a place, the spirit working mightily through his word, and you have this growing effect as more people believe, this multiplying effect of the gospel being preached, a radical transformation. In the same hallmarks, the preacher, God's word, the spirit at work, conviction over sin, repentance. So with that as the, the backdrop, with the a biblical backdrop to say this is what revival looks like in the pages of the New Testament, now for some church history, Ian Murray makes the argument that that American history, he says, was shaped by the Spirit of God in revivals of the same kind as were launched the early church into the pagan world. So he's saying there was genuine revivals in in American history, just like we read on on the pages of Acts. And I think one of those would be the, that he's talking about specifically is the First Great Awakening, 1730s, 1770s. You have this period where, where the gospel took root in society. Uh, men like Jonathan Edwards as a forerunner, George Whitfield, uh, Samuel Davies as one of the prominent preachers. And you had these, these preachers that were called uh, preachers of the Puritan spirit that had a high view of God and a high view of Scripture that preached expositionally in this growing zeal for religion, a momentum. Like Acts 19.20, the word of the Lord growing, growing mightily, prevailing. And as we talk about revival, maybe the question comes up, uh, what, what makes for a revival? How would you define it? When they had the, the Ashbury re- revival, that was the question. Is this a real revival? Well, then you start to get into what, what counts as a real revival? How many people? What are the, the marks? And in the book here, there's some, some key features that I think are helpful. I'm going to pinpoint just a couple of them, but, but he talks about a, a hunger for God's word, talks about earnest prayer being a mark of revival, talks about serious Christian literature. People actually were, were eager to learn theology and doctrine, uh, a sense of wonder and seriousness, a sobriety. Uh, the, also, another mark would be the same work evident in many places at once, different places, different cities experiencing the same thing. Uh, new energy in practical Christian service. There's a, a missionary activity that springs up out of revival. He also talks about a recovery of family worship and family religion. 
of fathers taking ownership of their, of their families and say, I have to teach my kids these truths. And then a, an observable raising of the whole moral tone of society. That would be one of the marks. But I'm just going to pinpoint really just three things is to boil it down, to look at both the, the first great awakening as a positive example and the second great awakening as a, as a negative example. Positively, here's what, a, what model that seemed like a, a biblical revival and then the, the second great awakening, more of what we call revivalism, trying to create revival, trying to manufacture a response. So first, the, the preachers. So we're going to look at the preachers, the response to the message, how did people respond, and then the power. And really, we're talking about the power, the, the Holy Spirit. But the question you have to ask in the, the second great awakening is, is who, whose power is being demonstrated? Who is being displayed? Is the Holy Spirit being displayed? So Martin Lloyd, uh, sorry, Ian Murray here talks about uh, just a generation of, of preachers being raised up, like-minded preachers uh, across denominational lines uh, with deep theology, uh, zeal, and conviction. And just a couple quotes here to capture uh, how he describes them. He says, Their pulpit oratory came from their hearts and from the reality of living near to God. They themselves loved the Savior whom they preached and hated the sin against which they warned. And one of those men was Samuel Davies. He was probably the most prominent preacher in this era. And he has a, just a quote from him. He says, Lukewarm religion, which did not make God the end for which men lived, would not take one to heaven. And he goes on to warn that the ungodly, sorry, it says that in his preaching, he warns the ungodly as though they were already in view of the judgment seat just uh, opening up heaven's, heaven's doors for them to see as he's preaching. God is on his throne and you are accountable. Ian Murray says, What was it that gave life to plain scriptural preaching? And the united answer was, it was preachers knowing and feeling in their own experience the realities of which they spoke. True Christianity cannot exist without real communion with God, and neither can true preaching and you're going to see a noticeable difference in the Second Great Awakening. There, there was a difference between uh, zealous preachers who lived what they, what they taught. That was the, the hallmark here of a, of a revival. Not just a, a zealous proclamation, but someone who lived it, someone who modeled it, someone who, who actually believed it. And then you get to the Second Great Awakening, and then it became a lot more about the, the oratory of the speaker, the skill of his presentation, the way that he could manipulate an audience. It, it was a lot more about the outcome, how many conversions, how many people came forward? Ian Murray says, uh, It's an easy thing to make noise in the world, to flourish and harangue, to dazzle the crowd with set and set them all agape. But deeply to imbibe the spirit of Christianity, to maintain a secret walk with God, to be holy as he is holy, this is the labor, this is the work. And he, he calls these men revival men. What do these men look like? He says they were men of spirit and fire. More cheerful men never lived. They lured to brighter worlds and led the way. Their preaching combined affection with authority. In Christ-like pungency in its personal applications with a holy unction that belongs to the spirit alone to impart. And this is where the, the revival started. The same way you see in the pages of scripture with the preachers proclaiming a message authoritatively, compassionately, winsomely, preaching the whole counsel of God, a theology on fire, as some have called it. And in this, there was a special season of fruit. And what's really interesting, though, as you read stories of these pastors, is that they weren't doing anything different in this season. They didn't change their methods. Some of these men had been preaching the same thing for 20 years, 30 years, the same pulpit, very few converts, small church, and then in a matter of, of two years, of five years, all of a sudden the church just grows. They didn't do anything different. They were just laboring one, one day in, one day out. They studied, they preached. They did the same things. They brought God's word. And the Spirit used them in whatever way he saw fit. It was the Spirit that, that caused revival. It wasn't the messenger. The messenger just delivers the message, faithfully declares it. But this did have a, a compounding effect as preachers are boldly declaring, more preachers are raised up. 
There's a, there was an increase here in missionary activity, a starting of seminaries, a, a zeal to train men for ministry, a seriousness about raising up another generation of faithful men in the church. And I just think about uh, just a great modern example of, you think about John MacArthur, a seminary not far from here where, where men from this church have gone that we're beneficia- beneficiaries of and a, a strong pulpit for 50 years. And just the, the gravity that that brings, people that, that come and people that are raised up in that ministry and sent out to other places. Even the seminary that we're a part of, the Expositors Seminary, is, is from men primarily who have, have come through that, that leadership, who have been part of that seminary. Now they're, they're starting the next generation, raising up another generation. I mean, this is where it started in the, in the Great Awakening. You had a generation of, of pastors saying, we're, we're going to preach the whole counsel of God. We're going to disciple. We're going to evangelize. We're going to equip the next generation. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, able to go down to Nogales. Um, there's actually a seminary in, in Nogales on the other side of the border, the Mexico side of Nogales. And it's a small Baptist seminary. And, uh, and they've been 50 years, they've been training men for ministry. And what's really incredible is they just have this heart to send men out to the northern part of Mexico. So we, we know that cultures are going to be changed if we can get a hold of the pulpits. We can get a hold of the churches. We can change societies through these pulpits. And uh, just one man there was talking about being sent out to this church. Uh, it was a church of 200 that he went to, uh, a church that was just caught up in a lot of formalism, didn't have Bible teaching. And he came and he, he preached. And, uh, and you know, you could, you could be a really poor teacher and you could dwindle, dwindle a church down, right? But, but the, what everyone said about this man is, no, this man can preach. And his church went from 200 down to 80. And they said, what What happened? So I just, I just opened the Bible, I preached the word, and, and people left. And, and then, but then after that, you know, he said 80. The 80 people that are there are pretty much all new people. You know, it's, it's basically gone and come. But, but you ask, you see that, and you ask the question, is that, is that faithful? That's not, it doesn't sound like a revival. That doesn't sound like a transformation. But, but that's the same, the same method that these men employed. They just preached the word faithfully, with conviction, with authority, with zeal. And the Lord is the one who causes the growth. So that was the, the commitment here of these preachers, to preach the word in season and out of season. And here it was in season. And it, this was a, a classified as a revival because of the, the spirit-empowered response. The response of the listeners. Ian Murray says that all awakenings begin with the return of a prov- profound conviction of sin. A profound conviction of sin. That's exactly what we saw in Nehemiah, in Acts 2, in Acts 19. People crying out, people weeping, people burning their magic books because of their conviction over sin. One revivalist pastor in the 1700s says that poor sinners began to see everything in the Bible was true, that they were wholly sinful and in the hand of a sovereign God. The first you would know of persons under awakening was that they would be at all the religious meetings in a manifest silence and eager attention. There was no commotion but a stillness. In our very streets, a serenity in the aspect of the pious, and a solemnity pre- apparent in almost all, which forcibly impressed us with the conviction that indeed God was in this place. Uh, not a emotionalism that's so often associated with, with revival, but, but solemnity, uh, actual conviction, quietness even. You know, you have a heightened emotional response as you can read about those as well. There's people weeping. There's services where, where they talk about every, everyone coming together and, and crying. So it's both. There's the emotional responses, but, but all of this ends with a piety, with reverence. And another, another author goes on to say during this time that Such sweet singing I have never heard in all my life. Dear young Christians, how engaged, how heavenly, how spiritually and innocently they look and speak. I have seen a hundred wet cheeks, some deeply penetrated with convictions, some fainting with love sickness, as it were, in the Savior's arms, and others rejoicing for the day of God's power and grace, all under the same sermon. So you have an emotion here at hard-hitting truth, but all of it toward praise. 
And Murray makes the point, I think it's just helpful for us, because really, when we talk about revival here, this is a, just helping us think about a, a philosophy of ministry. What should the church be about? How, how do we think about church planting, even? You know, what does Zach do when Zach goes to, to Papua New Guinea? Is he going to go after some specific method? Is there some, some special thing he has to do to conjure up a response? He talked about being, being in Papua New Guinea and, and getting, in the, getting ready to preach and having one person maybe in the audience and just waiting for a couple more to trickle in. So what does he do? How does he get more people to show up? Is there something, something magical he can do? Or does he just continue to, to preach the word, to be faithful, to pray? Uh, Ian Murray says, uh, this is in response to the thought that, that somehow the, the hard-hitting preaching, to, to speak the truth, to say hard things to people, is going to actually drive people away from the church. He says, To tell men the worst about themselves is not to hinder conversion. The real impediment to conversion is the absence of conviction of sin. The preacher's first duty is to address the fact, to address that awakening by the conscience to the meaning of sin and sin understood wrongly, sorry, it says, and to sin understood simply as wrong action requiring forgiveness, but more than that, as an evil principle governing man's very heart. What he's saying is not just to tell someone that, hey, you have committed a sin. That's true. You have committed trespasses and sins. But, but you have an evil principle, much worse than that. There is an evil principle. You are dead in sin. You are governed by sin. You are slaves to sin. This is what people need to hear if they are to, to have hope in the gospel. They need to understand their sin. They need to understand their offense against the holy God. And in this, there was a, a response, conviction over sin uh, in gathering with God's people. And there was also prolonged fruit. Prolonged fruit. These people gathered into the church. They stayed in the church. They worshiped in the church. They grew. They, they wanted to hear the truth. The, the church grew. Uh, all demographics of the church grew. So as you read about these, these kind of revivals, the church growing rapidly, you can see here, where, where does the power come from? How do you create this kind of revival? Well, obviously the answer, already been said, is the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we can make happen. Ian Murray says, the special seasons of mercy are determined in heaven. Not by us, determined in heaven. This is not something that we get to create. The Spirit is the one who gets credit. He says, the Spirit magnifies Christ. And the more abundantly his influence is possessed by believers, the more they will live for his praise. The test whether an experience is of the Spirit of God or of another spirit, is whether or not it brings a greater understanding of the Bible and a closer obedience to it. The ultimate end of all things is the glory of God, and that glory is not given to him other than by men and women being brought forth to comprehend the truth. So he's saying, how do you know if it's a genuine, genuine conversion? How do you know if it's genuine revival? How do you know if the Spirit is at work? Well, do people understand the Bible? Do they love the Bible? Do they start to obey the Bible? Do they want to hear God's truth? And he goes on to say, wherever conversions are multiplied, the cause is to be found not in men, nor in favorable conditions, but in the abundant influences of the Spirit of God that alone make the testimony of the church effective. So hopefully you can see this, this example, the first great awakening, a genuine revival, uh, conversions, the spirit at work through the word of God. And as we move forward in history to the second great awakening, uh, this kind of revival obviously is going to draw attention. Like the Ashbury revival, you see it on the news, it draws attention, it draws an audience, people come. They want to say, how do we get a hold of this? How do we create this where we're at? How do we package this up? I think about Simon the Magician in Acts 8. He, he sees the apostles doing miracles. How do I get that? How do I buy that? And you have a similar phenomenon. People saying, how do, I, how do I get a hold of this? How can I make this happen on my own? 
Ian Murray talks about the risk of, uh, he talks about expediency and ambition being these, these two things that, that together are so dangerous. Expediency, just to want quick results. Someone that doesn't want to take the time to sow seeds and to wait. To, to just sow seed week after week, year after year, and wait. But they want, they want quick results. And then you compound that with someone who has uh, ambition. Someone who wants to see their own significance. Who wants to see their own name made great. They're going to be willing to cut corners. They're, they're going to be willing to do whatever it takes to, to get an audience to build themselves up. Smed, I've heard Smed talk about uh, church planning this way. He says to guys that are thinking about church planning, that, that go, go and church plant and for seven years, just put your hand to the plow and look down. And then seven years later, maybe you can look up and look around and see what the Lord has done. But just, just do the work. Don't be concerned about the results. You just have to be committed to the labor. And then we get to the, the second great awakening, and you have what's called revivalism. Revivalism, again, is, is trying to, to create a revival. How do, we, how do we have the right external uh, influences, the right music, the right emotional response? How do we say the right thing at the right time to, to draw some kind, of a, some kind of decision from somebody? And all of this is, is through man-made means. And this is why you might have a bad taste in your mouth about the word revival, because you've seen this, you've heard this. You've seen it practiced. And you say, I don't, I don't want any of that. Well, this is what happened uh, by the end of the Second Great Awakening. Uh, a man named Charles Finney, who developed what, what he called new measures. Uh, you know, a gifted orator, compelling speaker, a compelling personality. And, and in this time period, you have the, the big tent meetings, big crowds, emotionalism, altar calls. They call it the anxious seat, come up to the front. You know, you're feeling anxious. Make a decision for Christ. All of those things started in this period. And just to look at those, quickly, those same three things, the, the preacher, the response, and the power. The, the preachers during this period, it said, where previously men were well prepared for the ministry of the word, it was now claimed that every American had the right to be a preacher. And a number of hot-headed young men, intoxicated with the prevailing element of excitement, and feeling confident of their own powers and their own call to the work, though entirely destitute of any suitable education, they assume the office of public exhorters and instructors. And he goes on to say that they, they rejected the, the ministerial office itself. In the 1700s, you had the, the high calling of pastoral ministry. And, then, and in here, it's, hey, every, everyone can be, a, can be a preacher. And they abandoned sound character. <laughs> At the same time saying, hey, we don't need so much doctrine. What's so interesting is there's this quote from Charles Finney where it says that the churches have too much theology and not enough gospel. And I, and I read that quote and I was like, man, I've heard that. I've heard that exact same phrase used today. And this is in 1850s. You have too much theology. theology. You need more, need more gospel. And there's a, maybe there's a right way to say, hey, we, we want to actually preach the gospel. There's good news here. It's It's compelling. It's exciting. It's a proclamation. So don't just, don't just give lectures without exhorting people. But he's saying, hey, we don't need to, to tell people all that, that deep theology. Just give them the basics. Don't, it's just hard for them to come back if you, if you teach too much to them. And you have a whole, a whole culture that buys into this. And this is in the 1800s. Then you can see the effects in the church today. Uh, a Bible illiterate culture. A consumeristic mindset. We don't, we don't need to read... We don't need deep, deep sermons. We just want a, some kind of pop psychology to feel good for our week. He says that, Ian Murray says that uh, the unscriptur unscriptural and disproportionate importance to human agency was representing man as a mighty agent rather than a humble instrument. I think that's a good way to, to summarize what was going on, to say the, the mighty instrument of, of, of man, of the speaker, of the preacher. And then a, a pressure to come forward, altar calls. Before that, it was, you know, preaching, exhorting. Obviously, P Peter preached. He exhorted. He implored people to believe. But that's, that's as far as it goes. We can't make people believe. We don't force them to make a decision. You know, Jesus is the, the same one who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. A call, come to him. And he also is the same one who says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
that the Spirit has to be the one to work in the heart. The Spirit has to be the one to give you the faith to believe. And then the, the response here, not, not a, so much a conviction of sin, but, but emotions. And he, you know, Murray says, once the idea gains acceptance that the degree of the Spirit's work is to be measured by the strength of emotion, or that physical effects of any kind are proof of God's action, then what is rightly called fanaticism is bound to follow. Uh, fanaticism to, to play up the emotions, you know, the, the high music, the tempo, the right chords, the right words, wanting a, a crazy response. He goes on to say that a young convert, in judging of the reality of his conversion, lays much stress upon having a great deal of joy and regards that as very decisive proof that he is a disciple of Christ. But this is one of the most fallacious proofs, and no dependence ought to be placed on it. Uh, Brian Farrell, one of the TES pastors, says it's not, it's not how high someone jumps, but how far they run. Not how high they jump, but how far they run. Meaning it's not the, the immediate response. It's not that they had some kind, of, some kind of response at a church service, but how far did they run? Did they persevere? Did they stay faithful? Was there fruit in their life? He says here that true conversion involves a radical break with the principle of sin and self-interest, which controls the natural man. And that is what's at, what's at stake here, is what, is what is true conversion? How are people saved? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Uh, it is a, about your theology of man, your doctrine of depravity, And the, the danger here, and the sad part here, is that there was just false converts, people that came needing to hear truth, needing to be convicted over sin. And instead, they were patted on the back and said, hey, you made this decision, you came forward. Go back, go back to, your, to your life, you're doing good. You have it all figured out. And now in a worse spot than they were before, with confidence, confidence now in their, in their sinful life that they haven't turned from. I love this quote here. He just talks about genuine versus false conversion. And he says that the, the false convert, the false convert believes that God is reconciled to them and that they are reconciled to him on that account. Because I believed, God is now reconciled to me. Because I made this decision, that's what he's saying. On the contrary, the Christian is reconciled because he sees the holiness of the law which he has broken and God's justice in punishing him. And he takes part with God against himself, cordially submits to him, and this when he expects condemnation. The true convert is reconciled because he is pleased with the character of God. The false convert, because he hopes that God is pleased with him. In all of this, you ask the question, who gets the power? Does the Holy Spirit get the, the credit that he deserves. Who has the power here? And it seems like this is a, a kind of revivalism that would, would highlight man's power, man's ingenuity, minimize the work of the, the Holy Spirit. And as you listen to all of this, maybe you're, you're asking the question, okay, what, so what? What's the application? What's in it for me? Why does this matter? You know, it's helpful to understand church history. It's helpful to understand what's going on in the culture. It's helpful to understand, okay, this is why churches might be the way they're at. But, but for you, individual Christian, uh, my hope is that, that you would actually be compelled to, to pray for revival, to be committed to the, the means that God uses to save sinners, to be fueled in your evangelism, that the Holy Spirit does indeed have power to rescue the dead, to, to bring to life those who are in spiritual blindness. I mean, to understand revival rightly, really this is why we church plant. We church plant because we believe in revivals. We believe that, that God will save people. This is why a team would go to New Orleans. We'd send our friends across the country this is why Zach will, will, will fly to the other side of the world, why Jeremy and Lori are in Papua New Guinea, why we sent a group of people in, in Gilbert, because we believe in revival. We want to see cities transformed. We want to see societies transformed. 
We want to see the gospel go forth. So the encouragement for you is to, to cling to these same means. There's not, there's not a, a special means that we, that we do, that we employ. Uh, he, he talks about, I think I read this at the start. He says the, uh, the only means, the, the primary means that God uses, uh, the teaching of the word and prayer. It's just so simple. The word proclaimed and earnest prayer. The prayer of God's people to see societies transformed. I love this quote here from Ian Murray. He says, the, the God of this universe is not dependent on instruments. He could fill the world with Bibles by a word or give every inhabitant of the globe a knowledge of the gospel by inspiration. But he chooses that human agency should be employed in printing and reading and explaining the scriptures. God is able to sanctify 400 million of Asia in one instant without the agency of missionaries but we do not expect him to do this without means, any more than we expect him to rain down food from the clouds or turn stones into bread. And the, we get to participate. The means that God uses, we get to participate in. God actually allows us. It is a privilege to be messengers of the gospel, to be ambassadors for Christ. And so if you have any takeaway this morning, I hope your takeaway is that you would pray that you would pray for revival, that you would pray for the, the churches that we're planting. My wife and I went to uh, Gilbert Bible, had an Easter service. It was an early morning service outdoors, and Josh Kelso is in a, in a park in a neighborhood just preaching the gospel, open air. And it's just sweet to think about this, this church, these friends of ours down the street preaching the gospel you know, in the shadow of the Mormon temple. And, and I'm convicted as I'm, as I'm thinking about this of, man, I need to pray for them. I need to pray for souls to, to, be, to be saved. I need to pray for sinners to be convicted. We need to pray for, for our missionaries in Papua New Guinea and Italy, for the, the church plant in New Orleans, that, that God would do a, a mighty work there. I just want to close with uh, Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Just a reminder in this. Luke chapter 10. The first two verses. So as Jesus is uh, sending out the 70, he says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And verse 2, he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech or earnestly pray that the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. That, that is the encouragement. That is encouragement from Jesus here. There is a, a harvest of souls in this city. And what's Jesus' first encouragement? To, to pray. To pray that the Lord would raise up men. Pray that the, the Lord would, would send the gospel out. Pray that hearts would be soft. Pray for, for more Omri Miles and, and Zach Hands and Josh Kelsos and Jeremy Laymans to be raised up, to be sent out. And as you, as you pray, as you become united in this purpose, in prayer, I think about the words of Charles Spurgeon on this passage. He says, As we are commanded to pray for laborers in the Lord's harvest, so are we bound to prove the honesty of our prayers by our actions. So we pray and then we, we evangelize. We become the, the kind of people that want to see societies transform, that want to see the gospel go, that, that take this message and run with it. So let's, uh, let's pray together to that end. Lord Jesus, you promise that you will build your church that your gospel will go forth. Lord, you uh, have all authority in heaven and on earth. And you send us out, Lord, as uh, ambassadors of you, going with the very authority of heaven to declare a message for a lost and dying world. And I pray that we would be bold even this week. I pray that we would be patient. I pray that we would be winsome, Lord. I pray that you would just, uh, the, the men and women in this room, that you would bring opportunities into our lives, that we could proclaim your truth, Think about this this morning. I pray for the, the preaching of your word. 
I pray that your word would go forth with, with boldness and authority and clarity and that you would draw many into this church, Lord, not for our sake, not for our reputation, Lord, but Jesus, for your sake, so that you would do a, a mighty work in this place so that everyone that's looking would only be able to say that the, the Holy Spirit did that in this place. And Jesus, he points to you, and you would get all the glory. Amen.